so my work really does focus on, on pregnancy and the role of pregnancy in the larger life course of women and how optimizing care in this critical time can improve not only baby's health but also women's health throughout their life course. So pregnancy is largely viewed as being a happy and healthy time as p expected parents are really excited about the birth of a happy and healthy baby. Um, however, for an increasing proportion of women, this actually can be a time of high anxiety and high stress as the prevalence of pre-existing chronic diseases is in, in an obstetric population is increasing substantially in Canada and in developed countries. Um, having a pre-existing condition or being at a high risk of developing an obstetric condition um, can cause a lot of anxiety in the, in the woman as she worries not only what this means for her health but what it means for the health of her baby. Now personally I find pregnancy to be a very interesting exposure or time period of study because it is a time limited event and exposures during pregnancy impact not only the mom but also the baby or babies depending on what type of gestation it is. Um, and they can also, pregnancy can also unmask symptoms and signs of risk factors that will impact the woman's health throughout her entire life. So my program of research aims to examine the impact of chronic disease on maternal and fetal health in the obstetric time period evaluate the ability of alternative treatments on disease control and obstetric outcomes, and then also to assess the risk of long-term disease complications following pregnancy. Now, optimizing birth outcomes really does mean optimizing women's health before they, be before they become pregnant. Unintended pregnancy is very common. Um, and what's important is that unintended pregnancies aren't always unwanted. So many women that have an unintended pregnancy will continue, the, will continue the pregnancy and go on to deliver a baby. We recently finished a study here in Calgary that found that of women that had unintended pregnancies, 20% of them, 20 of them weren't using any form of contraception, even though they claimed to not desire pregnancy. Um, this is so important because fetal organ development happens extremely early in pregnancy. So that means that when women are exposed to things early in pregnancy, it impacts not only their health, but also the health of their baby. Um, and with that in mind, our group is studying many different exposures in pregnancy that are happening early on. On. We have one clinical study right now that we're actively recruiting for looking at women with Crohn's and colitis who are exposed to a certain type of medication and looking at bo using both ultrasound as well as biospecimens in the neonate to look at neonatal outcomes but also women's health. We're using the THIN database to look at a variety of different exposures and medication exposures in pregnancy for women that have chronic remitting diseases, so things like depression or asthma or epilepsy or inflammatory bowel disease where you have, you have a condition but you have signs and symptoms that that wane and ebb and flow. And these women will often go off their medications during pregnancy and this in an effort to spare their baby from the impact of the medication. But what they forget is that the disease itself might also have an impact on the pregnancy. So with that, we're trying to look at what is the impact of having a disease flare versus an adverse pregnancy outcome for people who stay on their medication versus those that don't. But it's important to rec recognize, too, that not all exposures early in pregnancy are necessarily bad. Our group has recently finished a systematic review that just last week was published in the American Journal of Public Health, looking at international variation in folic acid fortification policies and, that, and its contribution to the, the prevalence of spina bifida rates worldwide. Now, women that have high-risk pregnancies have different health care needs than women that have low-risk pregnancies. This can be incredibly isolating for these women as they are very, sometimes very different than their peers. They all of a sudden are, may not have a good outcome and they have higher risk and they have other things that they need to be considered. And this may mean that different models of prenatal care, different interventions during, during delivery need to be considered for this group. Now, group models of prenatal care in low-risk women have been shown to help redu both reduce preterm birth rates and reduce cesarean section rates. And they really, can help, by helping women develop a peer support network, they've been able to improve self-efficacy and people's ability to cope with pregnancy. Um, we are experimenting with this in a, what I would consider to be a medically low-risk, socially high-risk group right now, where we're partnering with the Alex Community Health Center to offer a group form of prenatal care called Centering Pregnancy to a group of women who are new immigrants to Calgary who struggle with the English language um, and can generally be socially isolated. We are currently halfway through data collection for that and hope to be finished next August. And so far, anecdotally, we've had very positive responses from both care providers and women about that. We are also start, we recently got funding to start a new program by expanding this to a, a now medically high-risk population where we're working with obstetricians at South Health Campus to look at whether we can integrate chronic disease management into this group model of prenatal care and then segue women into better care through their primary care network after their pregnancy is over to result in better long-term health outcomes for women as well as their babies. 
Our group also has interest in fetal growth. Um, both extremes in fetal growth can be problematic, not only for the infant, but can also reveal issues about the long-term health of the mother and then possible issues during labor and delivery. Um, with this in mind, we've recently completed a clinical review of selective intergroterin growth restriction in twins where one baby grows, doesn't grow enough and one baby grows too much so that we can have more detailed information on outcomes to pass along to parents. Um, we are also in the middle of doing an analysis of some national data about looking at women that have diabetes in pregnancy, both type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes, because this group of women, the babies tend to grow excessively. Um, excessive fetal growth can be problematic for the mom and for the baby just because when the baby gets too big, there's an increased risk of birth injuries, both to the mother in terms of tearing, but also to the baby in terms of external injuries to the skeleton when it's born. Um, with this, we're doing a we're looking at the weak specific risks of injuries both to the mom and to the baby, and couple that with the risks of associated prematurity to basically hopefully to create some better information that can guide the planning for delivery in this group. Now, pregnancy is interesting in and of itself for what can happen in the short term. But what I also find interesting is that pregnancy can unmask risk factors for the woman's disease, women's health later in life. Women that develop preeclampsia in their pregnancy are twice as likely to have an adverse cardiovascular event in the first 10 years after delivery compared to women that do not develop preeclampsia. Um, for women with preexisting conditions, we suspect, but we don't know that this risk might be even higher. With that in mind, our group has recently submitted a grant that we'll find out about next month looking, about, looking at women that have adult forms of congenital heart disease to look at not only what the impact is of pregnancy on their on their disease control, but then also what the impact is of them having one baby or two babies or three babies on their long-term outcomes. Because we do know that pregnancy has a tendency to accelerate anticipated functional decline in this group, but we don't know at what rate and we don't know if, that is a, if there are lesion-specific risks associated with that. So ultimately, there are many unanswered questions about how to manage pre-existing conditions during pregnancy, how to stop pregnancy-associated conditions from forming, and whether or not current interventions that we have are actually effective in this group. My program of research aims to fill in some of these gaps by providing evidence-based information both to patients and also to care providers that will help people make the best and most informed decisions about what's best for them in the context of their life and their current health status. Um, none of this work is done in isolation. I want to take a moment to acknowledge um, only a few of the collaborators that have been very generous in donating their time and efforts to work on these projects, as well as our funding for some of these, these initiatives. Thank you.